Hello, and welcome back to the Future of Figure Skating. My name is Anna Keller, and my guest today is Megan Williams-Stewart. Megan is a board member of the Diversify Ice Foundation and is a strong advocate for inclusion and support for other skaters of color. I've been excited to learn more about the Diversify Ice Foundation for a while, as it's an organization that's making a significant impact for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the U.S. Since its founding in 2017, Diversify Ice has provided sponsorship award packages for over $30,000 to competitive minority skaters, has worked with underrepresented schools to introduce the sport to more black and brown kids, provided performance opportunities to minority skaters, and supported skaters of color all across America with financial support, mentorship, networks, and opportunities. As a board member and volunteer, Megan is a part of all of that work, and she's also a fascinating person in her own right. A former competitor for Team USA, she was the 2006 Andre Nepola champion and 2007 Nebelhorn silver medalist. Since retiring, Megan has worked as a coach and recently announced that she'll be joining the new Johnny Weir Skating Academy in the fall. We talk about all of that and more in today's episode. Megan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's great to get to talk with you. Thank you for having me. So I've been following the work of Diversify Ice for a couple of years, seeing the Instagram and some of the events. Could you tell me a little bit about how the organization got started and how you got involved? Yeah. So I got involved in 2020, kind of like peak COVID when everyone was sitting at home. Joel Savory, who started Diversify Ice, reached out to me during that time and was like, Hey, we're going to get a, I'm getting a call together, like with a bunch of people, would you be interested in joining? And he gave me some context of what it was about. And even at that time, I really didn't know about Diversify Ice and what he was doing pretty much at all. Just a little bit more background, but Joel and I knew each other from skating together at University of Delaware when we were, you know, late teens and Joel's younger brother, Emmanuel was a skater as well and is still a skater, but Joel Stop skating. I think he did shows. I know that he was a big financial supporter of his brother and kind of saw the talent that he had and wanted to promote him and give back to him in any way that he could. And like, just be a really good mentor as well. So I watched that happen in real time. And I knew that that's kind of what the long-term journey was with them, but I really hadn't, you know, heard from Joel for a few years. And I just saw Emmanuel here and there at competitions and whatnot, but he reached out. We had an amazing call with like a lot of, a lot of people, like a lot of like Michelle Kwan was on the call. Charlie White was on the call. Just a lot of people that really seemed interested in trying to support the cause of speaking up for underrepresented minority skaters. This was also kind of similar to the time that George, the whole George Floyd thing happened. And I think that people were just trying to take a stance and be supportive. And this was just one very small way that they could do that. Just like coming up with ideas, having the conversation, just being a part of it. That was how I got involved, at least initially. (laughs) So after that call, I felt inspired. Like, I was like, this is great. Good for all these people coming along, like coming together and like having the conversation and being really open about it. It's not like most of us were like, we were all pretty much sitting home anyway. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, Joel reached out again. He was like, hey, would you be you know, interested in being a little bit more involved, you know, being on the board? And I was like, yeah, definitely. Like, of course. And from that point on, like I was just in. And so what are some of the projects that the organization's been working on since then? Well, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of ideas. There's it's, it's all volunteer, right? So I'm not going to say that it's hard, but it is a work in progress. And there's been a lot of different ideas to have like different chapters in different regions. And, you know, then you have more people that are like, oh, hey, like that sounds great. I want to be involved. There's a lot of angles that we go about things and we kind of like see what works and welcome everything, but see what works and kind of try to repeat those positive experiences, I guess. A good example is like this year, Joel's younger brother was skating in a spring show, which was right in my area. And they reached out to see if we would want to, you know, advertise in their program, you know, kind of have like a sponsorship advertisement. And and it's all a fundraiser for the rink and the club anyway. I said, yeah, let's definitely do that. I'm going to go over, set up a table, like just talk to people, you know, have some giveaways. 
um, have some flyers so that people understand and know what we're about and just kind of start to spread the word and start to build like a database of people that are interested in becoming part of our organization. Whether that means like being rooted in the organization as a board member, as a volunteer, or just like if they want to donate to our organization or come to fundraising events and just, just kind of stay in the loop. So by going to like something like that, it gives us a presence and that's a positive like that's a positive thing that we did for our organization. And that's something that we need to continue to do because word of mouth and, and just promoting our organization and bringing awareness just to the whole, the whole project of what we represent. So that's one example of like how we're kind of learning as we go. <laughs> and then of course, like, you know, that we've had some skate raisers. We had one in Maryland for Juneteenth in 2021, I think it was. And then we had one just last February, a couple months ago in California, but just trying to have like an annual skate raiser at different locations, being inclusive to the community, to skaters, you know, outside of the community and just trying, trying to bring people together. Like, Hey, this is what we stand for. This is what we represent. We also have a little exhibition for some of our ambassadors as well during the same time and a seminar for people. And it just, it gives us the chance to bring people together and show kind of highlight some of the top minority skaters in the country. Yeah. One of the things that I've appreciated in terms of, you know, raising the visibility is the way that you've been able to connect some of the skaters who might have been like the one skater of color who was well known at the time that they were skating or some of the people who have had that success in the past with some of the people who are skating now and then hopefully inspiring others to get involved, but making those connections. And it seems like part of the success has been giving a platform for skaters of color who might not otherwise be, you know, getting that kind of national attention just from their like competitive results yet, but they have a lot to show and giving them that platform. Yeah. I have to say, you know, when I was skating, I could count on one hand, how many minority skaters there were. And it's been really cool to see some old friends come out of the woodwork when we had our last skate razor in LA. I mean, I live in Delaware, you know, 3000 miles away. So a lot of people that used to be on the East coast, maybe have relocated and just like kind of getting to see them again and have that bond and be like, Oh my God, remember we are friends because we were the only ones, you know what I mean? Like that is the bond that like has kept us together. And that's just a really cool aspect and reaching out. Like when we have these skate raisers, we promote the skate razor to communities, like maybe underfunded communities, cities that are like school districts that don't like have a lot of money, things like that. And it's, I think it's important for all of those kids come that come together and come to our skate razor or whatever kind of event that we're having. I think it's important and great for those kids to see, like, just as an example, other skaters that look like them or get the opportunity to skate where they normally wouldn't because it's too expensive and, you know, their parents can't afford it, but all of those different things, that is what brings the community together and gives kids an opportunity to be like, oh, this is really fun. I like this, or I'm good at this, or there actually are a lot of other people that are spread out throughout the country or throughout the state or whatever, but there actually are a lot of other people that look like me that can skate too. And if they can do it, I can do it. Like, I think that's kind of the motto. Yeah. It's a lot easier to be the only person like you in your immediate surroundings if you know that you're not the only person overall who's going through those experiences and you can have those connections. Yeah. I'm saying that, but I mean that in a very broad way, like not just being like African-American gender, you know, sexual identity, like that goes, that's a pretty broad spectrum for a lot of people. And I think that's where people feel isolated in their sport. And this is just one example of us coming together and being like, yep, we can all do this. There's a place for everybody. We're diverse. We can all do this together and be successful at it. So what would you say are some of the things that currently are barriers to having more, I was going to say kids, but I suppose, you know, people of any age, but having more people of color get involved in skating and be able to succeed? I think the number one barrier is the financial barrier because skating is expensive. I mean, that is the purpose of our skate razors. 
that is our purpose to provide mentorship, networking, awareness, and promoting skaters. But also we do try to work towards giving them some financial relief or financial help so that they can continue to pursue their goals without having that setback. You were saying for it might be too expensive even just to, to start skating for someone. The rink, at the basic skating prices might be too expensive, but then as you keep going, it just gets more and more so then that squeezes people out. Yeah. Like what I just said is, is mainly geared towards maybe higher level skaters that are up and coming and they do face financial hardships because of travel expenses, equipment expenses, coaching fees, ice time, things like that. You know, that is just one aspect, but for kids that maybe never you know, come from super low income households, maybe never have the opportunity. There have been some events that Diversify Us has held that have brought kids in from areas, school districts, just to like give them that opportunity to learn how to skate. And they might not necessarily have that, but for us trying to connect with that part of the community to give them that opportunity. And maybe nothing comes of it other than a positive experience, but it's still important. Well, and that positive experience, I think also can help with building a culture. I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about when I read Joel's book was some of the statistics about viewership for figure skating in the U.S. and how the viewership is also very racially skewed, that it's much more common for white people to be watching skating and like somewhat Asian Americans and then much less for Black and Indigenous Americans and thinking about well, if you don't see anyone who looks like you in the sport, it's a circular thing. But if you have positive experiences of skating, even at a recreational level, that might also make people more interested in watching and supporting. And yeah, just be even becoming a fan at the very least. Yeah, absolutely. With the financial support, how have you been thinking about, you know, limited resources, lots of deserving skaters? Obviously, I'm sure that there are more people you'd like to support than you're able to. I'm curious how that all works. We usually have a annual or semi-annual kind of process of having people kind of reach out and basically ask for help or ask for what they need. And we also work with Jackson Ultima. We have a contract with them that they're able to donate equipment to us. I guess you would imagine that we kind of are like the third party person, like the the in-between that like, hey, there's a skater in need. What can you give us? And so they work with us to try to provide equipment to people that need it. Um, They've been very generous. And it's great that we have that asset that we can use to help some of our skaters We've done like a social media reach out to skaters that are in need to let us know like what they need, what's missing. And then that's kind of how we've granted money to people. Yeah. It sounds like you've been able to really be a problem solver and help connect skaters to whatever the resource that they might be missing. There's always those like continuous training costs, but I know that sometimes it's like oh, now I need a new pair of skates or, oh, it's going to this competition. It's those like sudden big expenses that can be really tough for families to meet too. Some skaters have been ambassadors for us. And, you know, in one case, one skater, their family fell on a financial hardship and their coach reached out to us and said like, hey, this is what's going on. You know, like we could really use your help to get from this point to this point because there's a competition coming up and we want to finish out the season. At that time, you know, we've done our best and it might not be everything that they need, but we do our best to try to equally spread it out for skaters that need it. We just try to do our best at the time. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think with situations like that, it could also make a difference to a skater just to know that there are people who are, you know, paying attention and invested in their success you know, even beyond the direct help of the financial piece of it to know that there are people out there rooting for you and trying to make it work. Yeah. I think that sometimes they might not really even have any idea because maybe their coaches or their parents are kind of going about it. One of the things that we've done in the past is we had like a social media giveaway of like making a post, sharing it, um, tagging us in it, you know, giving a little blurb about yourself and what you do, what level you are, what you like, and we've had a giveaway like that for skates and blades before and just to like try to keep it fun. And that's not necessarily like for skaters that are in 
necessarily in need. They might need it. Maybe that's why they did it. But just to like keep it fun, promote them, promote us. Like, yeah, that all helps to grow the community. Sort of since around the same period when there's been more attention to racial equity and dating as well, I've seen that US figure skating came out with the Mabel Fairbanks scholarship and is trying to do a little bit more in this area. Have you all worked directly together with U.S. figure skating or are these more parallel efforts? Um, No, we actually have. I would say I would give U.S. figure skating credit for doing that, you know, on their own and maybe starting in a parallel manner, but they have reached out to us. We did do a U.S. figure skating takeover on Instagram back in February when we had our skate razor in L.A. So that was cool. And there is a little bit of crossover from their committee with some of our members and volunteers. So I think that that's important and that really helps kind of glue this all together for the best possible outcome. Thai Babylonia has been an incredible mentor to a lot of the ambassadors of Diversify Ice, as well as, I mean, I consider myself, I'm a board member, but I consider myself a volunteer. I would say she's been an incredible mentor to all of us, all of the board members, the volunteers, just like being really involved being hands-on, especially with the skaters and like just being really supportive and welcoming and encouraging to them at the last two skate racers that we've had. She actually had like a little luncheon for everybody that volunteered. That's a part of it. Not like everybody that came to the skate racer, like not the public, but she had a little luncheon at her home in LA and was just so welcoming and supportive and generous. And it just makes you feel like you have someone who has your back and, you know, just gives you that push for someone that's already been there and done all of that. Yeah, that's great. Where do you hope all of this is going to go in the future? I mean, you're in that early stage of having this project with some initial success, but, you know, where would you want it to be, you know, five or 10 years down the road? That's a good question. That's something that I've thought about because there's a few of us and we all kind of live in different locations. And like I said, it's a volunteer position. It's not our full-time job. And I felt really inspired at the last skate razor in LA and wrote down a lot of different ideas. You know, I'm not in charge of where they go. It's, it is a group effort, but some of my better ideas and like those of others, I would say it would be awesome if we had different chapters of Diversify Ice throughout the country, different regions and different chapters so that people, you know, could kind of run them simultaneously. And I think that that would help us cover more ground. Having a skate razor twice a year, and there's a lot of work that goes into it. Having it once a year is already so much work for everybody, but having it twice a year and 10 years down the line, all of these kids that are our skaters now and our ambassadors now, like in a perfect world, 10 years from now, they're sitting next to us. They're running their own chapter of Diversify Ice. They're giving back to the organization that gave to them and brought awareness to them and acknowledged them and influenced them. And they're giving back to our organization and continuing to build more programs and bring the community together. That is where I would love for it to be 10 years from now. That sounds great. There is so much opportunity to, with different regions of the country, I mean, so much of a skater's initial journey is centered around their club and the environment around them and their regional competitions or any of that. And so, you know, having that be available in more places would really benefit a lot of people and allow you to tap into, you know, other networks of support too. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your own journey in skating. Um, Since you were a successful competitive skater yourself, how did you get involved in skating initially? I started skating because of my mom. My mom was a speed skater. And when I was three, she was the president of a local speed skating club. And they like rented ice at nighttime at a rink in Maryland, like a regular rink, not like an oval or something, but just, just an indoor, she did short track. So they would rent ice at at night and she didn't want to get a babysitter for me. So she would bring me and they would set up. If you've ever seen speed skaters practice, I don't know if they still do this, but they like cut tennis balls in half and they kind of like, or, or they have cones too. They like lay them out and like make the short track. So that was like kind of my boundaries. I was within there and they were just, you know, making laps around me, but you know, she taught me how to 
stand up and, and skate. And I took it from there. And then she ended up putting me in figure skating lessons and I excelled really, really quickly and went into private lessons very quickly after that kind of got picked out. Like I was the better one. I remember like being in a group lesson and being at the end, like we would go back and forth across the rink. I'd be like, all right, guys, what's going on? Come on, hurry up. I'm, I'm done. Like what's next. And then one coach came over to me and moved me up to the other class. And I was so excited and then asked my mom if she could teach me privately. And she did. And that was kind of it. I quit gymnastics, figure skated since that point on. And you never thought that you would be a speed skater. It was always figure skating for you. Yeah. I had no interest in speed skating, like not skating in circles. Apparently I was always like jumping on and off the couch and bouncing around. So my mom was like, you would be better off doing this. You represented both the U S internationally and then Puerto Rico for a little bit. How did that come about? And was that a a different experience for you doing that rather than representing the U S it was, yeah, I did represent the U S ended up representing Puerto Rico the very last year of my skating career. So I was on team USA and I feel like I did very well internationally when I competed, I felt like there were no politics and at the time I couldn't really do any better than I was doing. And my, my result wasn't better at nationals. I couldn't do better than I was doing. And we made a decision to represent another country basically in order to try to make the Olympic team. And unfortunately during that time, my hip started acting up and I had never really been injured ever during my whole skating career, but I started to have a hip injury that would later need surgery. Like it actually, it needed surgery then, (laughs) but later on I would go on to have surgery and completely repair it. And it's, it's been great ever since, but it really prohibited me from training how I should have trained in order to go to Olympic trials, representing Puerto Rico and skate as well as I was capable of. So that was really disappointing. Two years before my last competition in Germany, which was Olympic trials, I had been second at that same competition to Carolina Costner and the girl that was third, Laura Lapisto. She was a European champion. I was capable of being better than I was in 2009 when my hip was messed up. It was disappointing and it didn't go the way that I wish it had. And I'm very regretful of that because I took a lot of pride in representing the U.S. and hearing your name being called from the United States of America was a very warm feeling. But in the moment, everybody thought that it was the best decision to represent another country to try to get to the Olympics and have that experience. And there are a lot of skaters in the U.S. It's hard to get that Olympic spot. And I knew that I was never going to get it in the U.S. I understand why that decision was made. I would do it differently if I knew the circumstances that I wasn't even going to be able to skate to the best capacity with my hip. And I'm a little bit regretful of how my career ended in that manner. I would have rather gone out representing the U.S. and, you know, kind of gone out on my own terms. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting because I've I've talked to a lot of skaters, you know, recently, both from the U.S. who have had the opportunity maybe because of, you know, where a parent had a connection or something like that to skate either for the U.S. or to skate internationally and have made different decisions, partly strategically, but also partly what felt right for them. And, you know, even internationally as well, there was one team that had an easy spot for Switzerland and then chose to go for a harder competition in Italy. And I was asking why it was like, it just feels better, you know, to be representing Italy and be part of a big team and be part of like their country and everything. And I think it can be very personal as well as strategic for skaters. And that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never know what the right answer is. And it's easy to say in hindsight, I should have done this. I wish I did that. I kind of knew in the moment that it didn't feel the way that I wanted it to feel not my hip, but my heart. Yeah. And it's okay. You know, I can't change it. And I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of my accomplishments representing the U S I absolutely am, but I would be lying to myself if I didn't openly admit that things were extremely political during my time as a high level competitor, which is why that decision had to be made. And that's why I'm here. (laughs) So that other skaters don't have to make that same decision that they can just sit where they are, be embraced 
supported, encouraged, and, um, you know, hopefully reach their full potential. Yeah. Yeah. Let their skating be the thing that decides where their potential is. Most of the time, if I have a, a little bio that I write for something, I usually say like, you know, can you just leave the Puerto Rico thing out? Because it's not how I want to be remembered. I want to be remembered for the highlights of my career. And that, that was representing the U.S. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that timing of skating can be so brutal that the opportunities that come every four years and you can just through no fault of your own, just have it not line up. Right. Yeah. Timing is everything, but I definitely made peace with it. I appreciate you asking that question. So I could just go on the record and say exactly what I felt in my heart for probably for the last 12 years. Oh no, 13 years. (laughs) I read an interview that you had with U.S. Figure Skating website, and you said that part of the challenge of being injured then and maybe why you didn't come back when you were recovered was partly the challenge of funding your career through that point. Is that also part of what has inspired you to work on that for others now? Yeah, definitely. So after I did end up having hip surgery, and to be honest with you, my quality of life was just not good in the manner of Like I couldn't get out of bed without being in excruciating pain. Forget skating. Like skating was, yeah, that was huge, but I couldn't walk the dog. Like I couldn't get out of bed without being in so much pain. My, I really needed my hip to get fixed. From that point on, once it was fixed, there was a lot of rehab that had to happen. And in the moment, it wasn't where it needed to be. In hindsight, it just needed more rehab is what it needed. So it was so much better. I could walk without pain. I could do a lot of things that I couldn't do before it. But I thought like, well, I should be able to skate by now. And it just, it wasn't right. It wasn't good enough. So I kind of felt like I had to let it go and just say, okay, it's fixed. This is the best it's going to get. And also like people were really interested in in working with me and wanting me to coach them. That sounded good as well. And I was starting to do that and get really, really busy. So I took that opportunity and that was great. But eventually when I was doing that full time, I was like, okay, you know, I need to exercise. I have to do something. I'm not skating anymore. I'm going to start running. I'm interested in running. I noticed like when I would go to the gym and run, my hip would hurt a little bit. And eventually after another six months, which was probably 18 months post-surgery, it just stopped hurting. It's like I pushed through the pain. I, I built it up enough in order for it to be better finally. And it just stopped hurting and it never hurt again. But the doctor said, it's only going to be three to six months and you'll be fine. You'll be ready to get back out there. Well, that wasn't true, but it's okay. (laughs) So by the time it was actually good, you know, I was like, mom, my hips much better. Maybe, you know, I would go and I would try to skate a little bit here and there. And the reality was my mom couldn't afford for me to skate anymore. You know, I was 22 or 23, maybe at that time, almost 23. She just couldn't do it. And I couldn't work and support myself completely. Like I couldn't pay my rent and pay for my car and gas and pay for my skating. And, you know, my mom was also a single mom. I think that's important to note. So the money ran out. It was, it was what it was. Thinking about those pieces of your story really reminds me of talked to um, a number of athletes who have had that part of going through an injury when you're already at your low and challenging point often is when the money can be hard if you're not getting money from being in a show. I think the U.S. is a little better at this than some places, but there are a lot of countries around the world where, you know, if you're not placing high enough in competitions, your money gets cut and all of those things that make it really hard to continue. Also, that encourages people to skate injured and encourages things that are not as healthy long-term as well. Yeah, I mean, there was a little bit of money that came with being on Team USA and a very low amount on the grand scale of things, but better than nothing for sure. And I was very fortunate that my coach at the time, Jeff DiGregorio, did set me up with a organization that provided a little bit of funding to skaters within this area. They still help skaters now. That was extremely helpful for a few years. You know, I think that I may have gotten a little bit of support from the Memorial Fund one year. You know, when like, when you can't afford something, like, you know, when you are in the locker room and you're sitting there and the top skaters come in 
with their designer purses and their designer, their Louis Vuitton skating bag, you know, roller bag or whatever. And you're like, wow, that must be nice. Like (laughs) we could barely afford to get here. I was not skating anywhere near the level of elite skating that you were, but that experience somewhat resonates with me just that you know, I experienced the difference between when I switched from going to lessons at the city rink that was ISI program and much broader range of people to skating at the figure skating club in the wealthy suburb. And suddenly it felt like, oh, I'm in a country club now. Not just that people have the money to skate, but that they're coming from families with a very different lifestyle and just set of expectations and sort of casual expectations toward resources. And it was one of the things that made that environment you know, did not necessarily feel like a welcoming environment, even if people weren't intentionally trying to be exclusive, that is you know, another aspect of that sort of cultural homogeneity that gets built up when everybody has to come from a certain level of resources. Right. Yeah. I think like that's something that really needs to be taken into consideration, you know, from whatever organization it is, whatever grant it is, whatever club it is, just in general, like the Mabel Fairbanks award went to, I believe it went to Alexa. And in that case, like that is great. Like that needed to happen. I mean, and that's, of course, that's just my opinion, but I guess that the way that I remember things is like when the Memorial Fund, when that money would get distributed to different people that necessarily didn't need it, they just applied for it because they could, but they didn't really need it. That kind of stinks. You know what I mean? So It's stuff like that, that I hope has gotten a lot better. I don't follow it closely enough now to know, but I'm just saying that was my experience at the time. And that's something that could have been different. I appreciate talking about all of this stuff with you because I I do think that so many of the different issues that we have in skating, you know, one of the roots is financial inaccessibility and the choices that that makes people make, but it's often hard to talk about money One thing I thought was really interesting when I interviewed Kara Korpi about the difference in skating in Finland, where she's from, and then in the U.S. was that even at an elite level in Finland, all the coaches are employees of the rink or of the club. And so you're, you pay your club membership and then the coaches just get a salary. And so it's still expensive, but it's much less expensive for coaching in ice time than it is in the U.S. in a much more you pay your coach and then you pay the club and then you pay for ice time. And it made me think about some of the ways that skating maybe could become less expensive if we had different arrangements, but there's a very set idea of how these systems are supposed to work. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds good. It honestly does things like that. And things like maybe (laughs) having the option to have healthcare for us, for coaches, not everybody's married or has a significant other that they can be on their healthcare or something like that. It has its pros and cons. You essentially can walk away with a lot of money, with cash. You can essentially walk away with with whatever you want. You can make it however you want it to be. And I think something like that would be awesome across the board and, and would make it a lot easier for coaches and skaters. Yeah, the other thing she was saying that she thought helped with that system, but maybe some of the coaches might not like it as much because you still had to coach skaters at all different levels, even if you were, you know, you had the elite students, you also still were spending some time with the other students. But I think that that could mean that there isn't as much quickly chasing after the skater that has the potential, you know, from day one, or certainly I've seen examples of people saying, oh, this skater is coming from a wealthy family. (laughs) I want to go after, you know, and coach those kids. I mean, there are coaches that go after a skater just based on the demographic all the time. I'm not one of them. I'm just saying that like, I hear it being said, and that's pretty much no different than whether it's race or money. It's the same. My personal philosophy, I don't need to be a hundred percent, you know, elite coach all the time. I really appreciate kind of breaking it up, honestly, because everybody is in skating for a different reason. Like whether you're an adult skater, whether you're recreational, whether you have realistic or unrealistic goals and dreams, you're not always going to have those elite skaters. It certainly can be fun. It can be heavy. It can be hard. It can be fun. But I think the most valuable part coaching that I've taken away over these last, I would say maybe seven to 10 years is that I've, I've watched a lot of my skaters go from the beginning to college and maybe they, they didn't necessarily make it to nationals, 
they maybe didn't even make it to sectional, some of them. And some of them did, and some of them did great. But in this weird way, I raised them and they kind of raised me and they taught me a lot about what kind of person, what kind of coach I want to be, what kind of influence I want to have on them. And I taught them structure and organization and being accountable just by seeing them every day and holding them to do what they need to do and, and to train how they have to train. They come back in the summer times and they're like, so excited to see me. And I always try to take them out to dinner every summer and kind of got out of control because there were like 10 of them. But now they've all graduated from college, at least that first initial group, they've graduated from college and it's really rewarding to watch them kind of like go through that whole journey and, and be so thankful for having me and have that relationship with them and feel like you impacted their life in a positive manner. That is better and more rewarding to me than someone like winning something because I don't have any control of that really. Once they're out there, they're out there. <laughs> I can tell them what to do, but I have like zero control. I only have control over the influence, the positive influence I try to give them. And that is the philosophy that I have that makes me continue to like coaching. Yeah, that's really great. So you're now in that kind of in-between part of a season. Do you have skaters that are getting choreography or starting to prepare for the next year? Yes. Yes, I do. Everybody's choreography is pretty much done at this point. And summer is like right around the corner. Kids are graduating in a couple of weeks and school's going to be over and it'll be summer schedule at the rink, which is fun. They're there all day and there's a lot for them to do. There's a lot of like additional office classes and Pilates and ballet and hit classes. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a lot for them to do and they're excited to be there. And it's just a, a really good time to build and make progress and also get home earlier while it's still light outside. I really like coaching in the morning. Like I don't mind getting up early and, and being there. Seven is like the perfect time to be there. Six, whew, that one is tough, but seven to like three or four, like to three, that that's like the perfect amount of time. I'm struggling to make myself a morning skater because um, it's the time that I have to skate is before work, but my body takes like twice as long to get warmed up if I'm skating in the mornings. Yeah, I was not a morning skater. Not at all. Nope. I had a 1040 off ice warm up and on the 1130 session, 1210 session break, two o'clock, 330. And if I was having a bad day, there was one more session in there. And then I worked out, but no, I was not at that rank before. 10 o'clock. It's funny. Yeah. How those things change is get older, go through different parts of your life. And so you're at the Iceworks, right? It's out of Philadelphia. Yeah, I am at Iceworks. And I actually, I don't know if you saw our post the other day, but I'm going to be joining Johnny Weir at his skating Academy in Wilmington in the fall. Oh, I didn't see that. That's great. Yeah. I'm pretty excited. That's the news. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's very cool. I loved what he had to say about the philosophy that he wanted to have with it. And yeah, that sounds really exciting. Can you say anything about what it's going to be like? Yeah. So I think the plan is for it to be run in like a group setting twice a day. And of course, like some one-on-one -on -one time, but for it to be run in like a very Russian training manner of having multiple skaters on the ice at the same time, taking instruction at the same time. and that's his initial plan. That's our plan. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. And yeah, a cool different way of doing things. I've seen in some summer camps and stuff that I've watched with skaters getting to do three at a time, taking lessons all from one guest coach and that kind of semi-private thing that you don't often get at the upper levels, but it's actually, I think it's kind of cool to see how skaters sort of push and support each other and like learn by watching each other too, in a way that you don't get if you're just you all the time. Yeah. It could be a very competitive training atmosphere. It, I guess it just depends on, on what, what the skaters are like and, and it should be, you know, a positive competitive training atmosphere, but I'm really looking forward to it. I, I think it'll be fun. Johnny and I have been friends since we were kids. Well, teenage kids. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to working with him and watching him become a coach and taking that step forward and influencing 
skaters coming up. Really cool that you're doing that. And it's really interesting, I think, to see skaters who have such, you know, strong personalities and strong presence on the ice then move into the, you know, working with the next generation. I spent some time last summer watching training with Stefan Lumbiel's school in Switzerland. And it was it was really fascinating to watch work on choreography and little bits of things with different kids and just have like a huge amount of enthusiasm and support for them. And anyway, it was just a really nice thing. And I'm sure that in his own way that that will be what it's like for Johnny as well. Yeah. I'm sure that that was really interesting. And I would love to see that for myself, just hearing that. I find myself wanting to still learn so much and find it super interesting to watch, you know, my peers just do things. Some of us, sometimes we get stuck in our own routines as people, but as coaches and like a good example, just going back to diversify for a second, when we had our skate racer, we had this little seminar the day before the actual skate racer part. And we welcomed people to sign up and they did. And there were people of all different levels and Roheen Ward. So Roheen and I have been friends for a long time and he is amazingly talented he's just so awesome. Like, like you just have no idea. You have to just see the lines. You have to see it for yourself. And, you know, you see what he does and he puts how he puts programs together, but I hadn't been on the ice with him since the one before. So 2021. And before that I hadn't been on the ice with him since, you know, maybe I was 15 or something. And just seeing him and watching him do these exercises that like some of, some of them I've done before, some of them I haven't done in years. And, and it just, it's so influential for me as a coach to see somebody else and be like, wow, I need to be doing that. This is great. How, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I remember that? I, you know, you do know what I mean? It just, it is so awesome. And I look forward to doing that with Johnny and having that feeling and I'm, I always feel like I kind of have my eye out to see what someone else has to offer and use their techniques and use their teaching methods because there's not, you know, there's not just one way of doing things. We all get kind of stuck in our ways and think there's one way, but we're not all made the same. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Even in my class where we were, everyone was working on our single flips that all of us as adult skaters have had and lost and had and lost like 12 times. It was really fascinating watching a coach go through and work with each person to be like, okay, your entry is going to need to look like this. And your entry is going to like, and realizing that actually to be a successful coach for our group with our many um, hangups and issues and what yeah. involved knowing five different methods of doing a flip because if it was only like one method and one set of exercises, four out of the five of us would have given up in frustration probably. Right. Right. So we have this adult class every Sunday currently at Iceworks and there, we have a rotation of coaches and I really enjoy, I actually do. I really do love teaching adults because I feel like adults are there because they want to be there and from a financial standpoint, they're paying for it. So, you know, they're not forced. They're not being forced. They're there because they want to be. I really gained like a bigger, more of an aspect of this because I started snowboarding four years ago and I had never been on skis. I had never snowboarded my mom. Not only could she never, she definitely would have been able to afford it now that I know how expensive it is, but she was worried about me. My godmother would say, you know, can I take Megan skiing? My mom was like, no, no way. She's going to break something. So when I met my now fiance, Phil, him and his family have snowboarded their entire life. It's just what they did. So I'm like, well, all right, sure. Let's try it. I have never sweated so much in my life outside in the cold. It was so hard, but I wanted to do it. I wanted to be a cool kid. I wanted to be able to ride with him. And now I can do it. Like I went down on black last year. I can do it (laughs) black diamond and I have my own board and everything, but it's like one of those things learning as an adult, I understand why it might be scary to fall now. You know, I didn't have that perspective five years ago because I skated, I fell, you know what I mean? Like, but when you maybe don't feel as comfortable uh, doing something and you fall, you're like, Oh my God, I'm going to fall. I'm going to get a concussion. I'm not going to be able to go to work. You like have all these other thoughts and it definitely changed my perspective, but in teaching the adults, I had a greater, (laughs) a softer spot for them in that way. But I also, to get back to what you were saying, like teaching something differently, when you have all different levels Mm -hmm. of whatever type of skater it is, you have to really adjust for them. Like if they can't do 
backwards fizzles. Okay. They have to do forest fizzles. You have to find something that works for them to give them that positive experience and like make them feel included. And like, they've gotten something out of the, the lesson. I think of everything as a building block. And you like, sometimes just have to like step back down, step back down until you figure out where the weakest part of what you're really working on is. Well, I'm excited for your continuing coaching adventures. I always like to end the podcast with asking, how can skating be more inclusive and healthier? It's a giant question. So any, any thoughts, big or small are welcome. I think that skating could be more inclusive if everybody realized that there really is a place for them, no matter who you are or what you look like. There are so many different layers of basic skills, hockey, theater, synchro, speed skating, adaptive skating, special Olympics, like knowing how big skating really is and how promoting it as a whole that would make everybody feel more inclusive, promoting everything about it in every kind of category that there is, that would make everybody feel more inclusive. Thank you so much. This has been a really interesting conversation and I so appreciate everything that you're sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the questions. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Megan Williams Stewart. You can look at the show notes for links to a transcript and to many of the things we discussed. You can follow Megan on Instagram at M-E-G-A-N-A-W-S and Diversify Ice at Diversify underscore Ice. You can reach me with comments or suggestions for topics and people I should talk to by email at fsfuturepodcast at gmail.com or on Instagram and Twitter at futurefspodcast. If you appreciate the podcast, you can also support my work with the tip jar at futureoffigureskating.podcast.co. Remember to subscribe to the future of figure skating on whatever platform you use and share it with your friends.